happy fortunate today to be joined by Professor Joe Thompson Kuhn. So Joe is going to be talking through some of her experiences in creating, uh, you know, creative research outputs. Um, and Joe has worked at Exeter since 2009 with the evidence synthesis team, which she leads, um, has a huge amount of experience in this area. And as I've said in workshop one, these workshops are around sharing our experiences of different approaches to create uh, communicating research creatively. It's not a definitive how to guide because there are so many different ways of doing this. Um, and you know you will find your own path depending on the research you're doing the budgets you have the teams you're working with uh, but hopefully it is a useful insight to hear about some of our experiences and to work through some exercises to help sort of broaden those horizons a bit so i'm gonna move on to slide two which is just to say how this workshop is going to be structured. We've got an hour and a half. It starts at two o'clock, so we finish by 3.30. Um, well, I'll just give you a very, very brief introduction to the workshop and to Joe. We'll talk through the agenda and how this will be structured, and then we'll have a forward look to the next and final workshop, which should be quite exciting. Um, so that final workshop, workshop three, is on the 22nd of May, and it's with Dan Porter, who is one of the co-founders of Scriberia, which is a visual thinking agency I've worked with a lot, Joe's worked with, um, and they've done an awful lot of research and collaboration in this area. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. So the agenda for today is to talk about creative approaches in research, um, and part of that will be sort of Joe's experiences in this space. We'll have a, a little exercise and come back and talk about that. Then Joe's going to talk a bit more about strategic decision making and using uh, creative approaches appropriately. Um, then we'll have another exercise. Then we're going to have a 10 minute break. That will be around 2.50. And then we're going to come back and talk about building networks long-term impact and then we will wrap up um, and have a quick space for feedback and uh, any questions about the next workshop. So without any more chatting from me I will hand over to Jo. Hello, hi everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk just uh, may not be for as long as 15 minutes a little bit about um, as Harriet said, my uh, experience with using creative approaches in research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, um, why creative approaches and some of the things that we've learned. Um, okay, so uh, I'm a systematic reviewer. Um, I have been actually working in Exeter since 2000, so a little bit longer than Harriet said, and I've been doing systematic reviews for all of that time. Um, and uh, I currently lead um, several NIHR-funded um, evidence synthesis um, programs and also have had some funding to do sort of individual projects, but it's all evidence synthesis and it's all really different topics. Um, so I guess creative approaches, um, I've been thinking about that maybe them for maybe since about 2015 uh 2014 2015 um and i've listed there some of the things that we've done um short briefing papers blogs podcasts animations illustrations you heard about the board game that um, noreen made um last in the last workshop and also really simple things like twitter cards and some of the ways that we shared Thing. So it isn't just about making something creative, you've also got to find then a way to actually share it. So um, I'm still calling it Twitter, but it's X. Um, so different ways that we've shared things, Twitter, um, using just paper, via email, newsletters, face-to-face -face meetings, virtual meetings. And um, we don't have our own Facebook and Instagram, but we have used those, uh, other people's. So lo lots of different experience, and I guess it's been thinking about what works best for um, which project at, at each time. Um, so next slide. Okay, so why do we do 
creative approaches in research and I guess in some respects it's because funders expect it so whilst, whilst we might have written in a um, funding application you know 10 years ago you know we will publish three papers in peer-reviewed journals and present at academic conferences and the funding panel would be completely happy with that now we might write something so this is from a bit um for a project we did on intergenerational interventions so systematic review and so this is what we were kind of saying at the application stage so as well as publications within the Campbell library we're going to share the findings using a variety of formats like blog posts briefing papers podcasts and we're going to target those to suit two specific audiences and we're also going to work with our steering group and our advisory group to make sure that our findings get to the people who can benefit from them as well as those who design and plan and deliver services so there's been you know lots of interest in um the way that we communicate research and the importance of impact um getting the research to um people that can use it and um so my core role uh, is within um penarc which um but most of you have heard of the collaboration between the NHS and academia in the Southwest. And now our kind of mission statement is to improve the lives and quality of health and care in the Southwest through applied research. And to do that, we need to be able to get relevant and useful research to the people who can use it. So I suppose that's also a really big driver. So the funder, but also like, what is it we're actually doing here? We're trying to uh, improve um, health and care and so we need to be able to get the research to the people who can use it um okay i think it's the next slide it's hard that i can't control the slides <laughs> um so another reason i guess another reason why i got into creative approaches um for research is i was inspired by sarah chapman who uh, was the knowledge broker at cochrane uk and sadly cochrane uk um, funding ran out in March this year, so it's no longer a thing. Um, but Sarah was um, just really inspirational. I feel anyone has ever read or even just seen the front of a Cochrane review, you'll know that they're very tedious. Um, and Sarah just did an amazing job of making all of that evidence really um, accessible and interesting. And so there's some links, I'm guessing you'll get the slides. So, um, the evidently Cochrane blog has been archived. It's still all there, but it's a really some really fabulous examples in there of how um, to make the research, which is really important. Uh, Cochrane reviews are like the gold standard of evidence synthesis. How to make it really interesting and useful um, for the people who can use it. And there was one review in particular that I just thought, oh gosh, this is like it's really there's really so much more we could be doing apart from just publishing our papers so they um cochrane published a review on portion size um i think it was in like 2015 and basically i mean it was a very interesting review likely to get picked up by the media because it basically the um result of it was if you put more food in front of people they will eat more so that's like a really simple message a really easy message and something that um, Public Health England, as it was at the time, were really interested in. But the way that um, they um, kind of um, went about sharing the research, so they did their Cochrane review, but they also had a, a blog post which contains a video and an animation and infographic, so that was making it like again much more easy to access uh, access and understand so that is a, a useful way of sort of drawing people in but they also wrote a policy relevant paper in the bmj which has like okay so you're the policy maker this is what you need to do this is what you need to know and that also includes um a podcast and an infographic um and they uh, had like a website story that reflected on all of their media attention so um, and the media coverage and then they wrote a methods paper describing their approach to communication so how did they go about this it talks to you through like how they wrote a communication plan how they worked out what their key messages were 
and then how they thought that this is going to be the best way to share those messages. So it's a really neat example and that that it kind of shows that they we're trying to have the Cochrane review is that that's the kind of the the research and the results. Then the blog post is trying to get to people who maybe don't have time to read that whole thing and I'm not sure who anyone would ever have time to read the whole thing. Blog post has got like the the key findings and an easy way to read it. The policy relevant paper is there to get to the policy makers, the website story, potentially um, that's for researchers as well to get sort of their interest in and why how we can communicate better. The methods paper then really that's really for the researcher audience. You know, this is how we got went around our communication. This is how you could do it. Um, and then thinking about different methods as well. So the podcast, um, just because um, different people have different preferences for the ways that they access information. And also different people on different days have um, different preferences. So that I felt like that was a really good example. And like, really, we could be doing more than just publishing our reviews. Um, next slide, I think. Um, yes, um, so some of the things that Sarah got us really to think about um, were like what is it you're trying to do when you do creative approaches in research or when you're trying to communicate your results and I think it comes down to um, these three key questions and these are the questions that sort of underline all of the creative dissemination that we do. So what are the key messages? Who needs to know about them? And how can we get the messages to the people who can use them? And it is that simple. It's like, what are you trying to say? Who are you trying to say it to? And how are you going to say it? Um, okay, next one. Okay, um, I think we missed one somewhere along the line, Harriet, but no, no worries. Um, so this is some of the things that we've learned um, along the way and um, I'm going to talk about I think there are seven different things that we've learned and then I've got an example that explains it, that covers um, some of those. Um, so being really clear about what your aim and purpose is um, so your, present, your aim and purpose of your creative approach should be to present the key messages in a useful and accessible way. So none of this is rocket science. It's, it's really simple. But sometimes we forget um, what it is we're actually trying to do because the, um, the creative approach is probably much more exciting than writing a scientific paper. <laughs> Um, but the main aim and purpose of it is to try and get those key messages out in a useful and accessible way. Um, using a multi-layered approach, this is something that um, Sarah Chapman really um, advocated for. So it's really easy to think that we just got to think of the one way that we're going to. Is it going to be a blog post or is it going to be a podcast or is it going to be we're going to tweet about it or whatever. But actually, because as I said just now, different people have different preferences on different days. And also, um, whilst when you're talking to sort of marketing, communicating, communication people, they might say, so who's your audience? That's what you've got to do. You've got to imagine your audience. But we're going to have lots of different audiences. And on any day, you could be a mother, a daughter, a carer, um, I don't know, a nurse. Um, and in those different um, uh, settings, you're going to have different requirements. So you might just want to know the answer really quickly, or you might want to read it in a lot of detail. And you might want, you might be really interested in a podcast, or you might be really interested in, in you might be much more attracted to visuals. Um, it's very difficult to kind of pigeonhole and say, <coughs> okay. So nurses, we think they're going to want, um, I don't know, they're going to want podcasts because, because, you know, they're not all the same. So thinking about a multi-layered approach, maybe something quite simple in a tweet that maybe leads somebody onto a blog, that maybe leads them onto a podcast, that maybe leads them on to the full paper. And then <clears throat> maybe after that, there's a policy paper. So... Yeah, lots of different ways is probably the answer. Um, 
thinking about digital versus non-digital so we well i certainly spend most of my time looking at a computer if i'm not looking at a computer i'm looking at my phone um and so is it is easy to forget that not everybody is on a device all day every day and sometimes your most um appropriate method to share your uh, creative approach might be on paper and i'm not sure if noreen mentioned this in the last um in the in the last session but for the um robo pets and pet therapy project we created a briefing paper and normally we would just email that to people or we'd put a link to it on twitter and actually we realized that from talking to them that people who care him staff they don't sit on their phone all the time they're not looking at it so they needed it in paper they needed to put it on the notice board um, I think for other projects we've had posters it's just a, talking to the audience to find out where do they normally access their information um, there was a project that we did with uh, children and young people and we we asked them did they go on Twitter and they were like no way of course we don't Twitter's for old people um, so you know maybe depending on your topic it may be that you need to venture into Instagram or TikTok or, or something like that um, so role of non-researchers so they're really really important to help you to distill the key messages and um, help you to work out where you're going to share your um, product so as researchers we usually get really tied up on the methods we want everybody to know that we did a fabulous job that we used really exciting methods that um you know we're really clever and actually the people who are going to use the research they don't care about that they're not they would like to know that it's been done well but they don't want to know all the ins and outs of how you did it they're not really interested in um in how clever you are uh, they just want to know what the message is and how they can use it and so talking to non-researchers and getting them to help to see what are the key messages is really important um choice of images this is another um sarah chapman thing and there's i uh, haven't got the link to it but there is a whole lot of stuff on um on the cochrane site about using um images and i realize that as a mistake that i should say the wrong image will draw attention away from the message so if you use the wrong image um there was a big campaign on twitter not so long ago um which was hashtag no more wrinkly hands i think it still is the case that often there's if there's a, a news story now my slides are gone all together um if there's a news story about old people often the picture that they use um is uh, of an old wrinkly hand and actually um, not all old people have wrinkly hands. I think there was something on Twitter just the other day about um, was some advert for a writing competition or something for over 50s and they used wrinkly hands for that um, and um, yeah I think over 50s that's quite young to be considering that we'd all have wrinkly hands. Um, uh so the next point is evaluation um we have tended to do very informal kind of iterative evaluation um some people like to do something more formal i guess it depends what your what your purpose is but you do in some at some level want to know whether what you're doing is working um so it's a, something to think about. I, a lot of people will collect like statistics on, you know, how many people downloaded it or how many, um, how many clicks on Instagram or something, and that's useful. But you don't know what happened as a result of that. So sometimes talking to the people who you're hoping will be looking at your um, output is is more useful than the numbers. And then the last one is to is unexpected benefits. So sometimes um, just by having the conversations with your um, potential audiences, you're helping them to. Um, it is like two-way conversation. So the researchers will be learning, but also the um, maybe the healthcare professionals will be learning. Maybe we've found sometimes in our uh, projects that. 
healthcare professionals then understand much more about what is a systematic review because they've been part of the whole process and they've been part of working out what the key messages are and they understand more about the limitations of a review, the limitations of the research. And that's those two-way conversations um, really helpful and also in improving clarity around what the key messages are. So I think that one is done. So I'm just going to give an example which hopefully talks to some of those things about how we go about um, creative communication. Um, and I have given the links there so you can see you can see them later and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the products. So this is a review about um, caring about care, improving the experience of care for people with dementia in hospital. It was three systematic reviews um, and we were interested in, um, so Ileana knows lots about this one so hopefully she's not going to catch me out when I get it wrong. <laughs> So we were interested in things that have been tried to um, to try and improve the experience of um, acute hospital care for people who are living people who are living with dementia, whether they work, whether they're value for money, and what people's experiences was of them. And we included prior and current carers, healthcare providers, commissioners, and researchers. And as a result of the project, we developed 12 pointers for service change, which are key institutional and environmental practices and processes that could help improve the experience of care for people with dementia in hospital. Um, we took a, um, a, um, like a multi-layered approach. So we started off by writing a briefing paper and the briefing paper is really helpful in getting a very brief summary of the whole project. So you can imagine three systematic reviews. I think the whole report was about 50,000 words, many, 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 many pages. But if you want to then communicate with an artist, you're not going to ask them to read it. And so distilling everything down into a briefing paper, and we use a format of one plus three pages to so the first page, I'm going to come on to that in another slide. So briefing paper. Then we also wrote some blog posts. And then we worked with an artist to create a visual representation of the points of the service change as an A5 booklet. And the intention was that that would be distributed in paper format to um, hospitals. We also had some of our researchers and carers speaking on BBC Spotlight. And then we had the peer review publications, conference presentations, and a summary paper on the pointers for service change, which informed the British Geriatric Society position statement. So lots of different outputs, as well as the massive um, report. And the next slide should be about the briefing paper, I think. Yeah, so the briefing paper is um, on the first page. We have basically a summary of what um what we did and what we found so the next click should be like a mm, no yeah <laughs> so what we were trying to do and a link to the full report and then we reserve uh so the middle two pages are kind of the meat of what we found and then the back page uh which is shown in that last picture is the bit that actually researchers want to talk about most so we mostly want to talk about how we did it and what we did um, so we, we put that on the back because um, likely the um, people who are going to be wanting to use the evidence they don't really interested in how many studies we had or, or where they were from and so the next slide is about the blog post so we, this is our blog, uh, Evidence Synthesis Team blog, and we wrote a post which was trying to reach out to people who might be interested in the findings of our results. Um, and we were asking them, um, what do you think? So we know that this is what we found in the research, what do you think? And we were hoping from that we would get some um, input into the pointers for service change. Um, we set up a caring about care forum um, to try and continue the conversation so that was trying to be a little bit more interactive with the audience and then the final one I think is the booklet 
So this is where we worked with an artist and um, he created this image of a hospital with the 12 um, um, pointers for service change, one in each room, and then each page um, of the um, booklet has a different letter. So this one was A for Ask Family, and this is um, the cartoon draws from the research and is explaining this at this point of a service change. So when we first created this, um, we gave the artist a briefing summary. He talked to us a lot about the project and um, he went away to design it and to think about how we could present the 12 points of a service change in a booklet. Um, and the first draft that came back, when we showed it to our clinical um, partners, they were like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's not what a hospital bed looks like. Um, because the artist had drawn what he thought an artist, he did not, uh, he was an artist, so he didn't work in hospitals, hadn't been in hospital for a while, didn't know what hospital beds looked like. And um, they said, oh, no, you can't have a chair like that. There's no way we'd put um, an old woman in a chair like that because she would never be able to get out of the chair. So we had to then go back to the artist and ask them if they could redraw lots of the bits, which um, was a little bit challenging, um, but really shows the importance of working with the audience because it wasn't until we'd corrected those things in the images that we could really get the clinical partners to engage with the text and what we were trying to say. Um, is there another slide? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so hopefully that um, example shows some of the things, uh, the, these um, points that I was making earlier, um, that we, I think the multi-layered approach, uh, digital versus non-digital, we really wanted this to be a non-digital booklet that was in staff rooms, but unfortunately it was um, ready to distribute in uh, early 2020, uh, at which point uh, with the pandemic there was no paper in hospitals um, and so we, we weren't able to distribute it in that way um, and it has been distributed digitally but I'm not sure whether it is successful as a booklet like that, a digital booklet as it would have been if we could have done it on paper. Um, the role of non-researchers is really, really key. Um, choice of images, that's again really key. We really needed our clinical um, our clinical experts to help us with that um, because we can check it and like we're not really experts on what hospital beds look like either so we would have missed it. Um, evaluation was a bit tricky because of COVID um, so we're not sure how much this has been used but we because we were able to do the summary paper um, and um, publish that, that also includes this. So we have found another way to share it um, through like a peer reviewed paper. Um, I think maybe that's the last one, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. Hopefully that is helpful and I'm happy to answer any, any questions on anything because I feel like I've gone through it quite speedily. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. If you have got questions, do pop up in the chat. Uh, oh, yes, we've got some questions already. So one question was around the reach of the blog post. Do you know how far you reached, how many people you reached with that? Um, yes, but I can't tell you. Um, we can see that on, um, we can see that on the, uh, I think we use it's WordPress, and you can see who's, who's clicking it and where they are. Um, I do, we don't tend to get any comments on that. I think um, uh, the tricky the tricky thing about um, all of this, I think, is we relied very much on Twitter um, previously, and now we don't have Twitter. And I don't know that we have a good alternative. Um, so I'm on Blue Sky, and I haven't really found our people on Blue Sky, and I post there and nothing happens. Um, I'm on Threads, but Threads is linked with Instagram, so it's all my personal um, 
contacts, so I don't really use threads for work. I don't really look at threads. Um, so, and the uptake on Twitter has really, really dropped off for us. So, um, I think it is a bit of a challenge. Um, do we, yeah. Blog um, posts work. Blog, blog, our best, most successful blog posts come when you're able to tag in people that you've, um, that are, that have had some connection with what you're talking about before uh, and on Twitter, and, but you're relying on them still being on Twitter. So, yeah. Um, and the other question we've had is how do you source your artist and can you give a ballpark figure on costs? Can you remember how much that costs? I can't remember how much that costs. Um, well, there's several that we work with. Um, this particular artist who did the this one was a friend of a friend. Um, I think we've got another example later who's somebody from Exeter um, and it's a, it's less than a thousand pounds I think but it's probably it's probably in the region of six or seven hundred I'd say but it guess and that it, was 2020 yeah so that yeah. will have changed but yeah. yeah and it I think it depends on what you're asking um, yeah yeah, and equally, we've got really helpful comments. The uni has got a preferred list of suppliers. So again, Exeter has that. Um, your own institute, if you're watching this on the recording, will have a list of preferred suppliers that people will have pre-registered for. So it's worth asking your um, research teams for that. And then CAMP um, is a regional network of professional artists, which is worth knowing about and we'll make sure that all these links and comments are incorporated into the workbook that I'm producing for the end of these workshops. So you will have access to all these resources at the end. Um, so in terms of timing, Joe, I'm sorry to uh, make you keep talking, but I think we're going to forego the first exercise, which was really to reflect on your own research and the different sort of routes that you might have to um, creating more creative outputs. Um, I think we'll move straight on to strategic decision making, if that's okay, Joe. You mean I talked for too long? <laughs> no, you were just very interesting. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna share screen again for strategic decision making. Um, and we will crack on, if that's okay, Joe. Yeah, Can you see I that? recognise this slide, do. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Let's, let's go to the, the next one. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Do you recognise that slide? Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, okay. I think so. <laughs> I wonder if they've gone in the wrong order, but it's fine. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be kind of um, repeating myself a bit, I suppose, because we haven't had chance for a break for you to forget what I said. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, so I guess we're thinking strategically now. Why do you want to use creative approaches? So, again, it's about considering the aim and purpose, um, speaking to your potential audiences, thinking about what the key messages are, who are you trying to reach, do you have the interests and skills in the team and what time and resource is it going to, to take? Um, so I think some of these are challenging and I think the next slides are going to talk about the challenges. So, um, yeah, a clear plan, as with everything, is really, really helpful. And starting early. So, you, I mean, one of the challenges is that when you're writing your bid, um, often you'll need to say in it what you're going to do around dissemination and that's um, a challenge because you don't yet know what you're going to find so you could you could say oh we're going to make this video and we're going to do this and this and this and then if your results don't really fit with that um, then that is you might it's not not going to be successful so um, but starting to think as you're sort of getting your early results, starting to think, okay, how are we going to communicate these? Talking to your partners, uh, clinical patient partners, um, to starting to think about um, how, how we're going to present it and what we think the messages are. 
And starting simple and building up. So starting off by just being able to distill into plain language what it is that you found and what it is you want to share and then build that up. Um, sometimes um, having a the, like the plain language summary is a really good what something that's really easy to share with other people. So it might be sharing with an artist or, or um, a podcast person or sharing with other people in the team, sharing with um, just other people um, as a way of saying, no, is this interesting? Who should we share it with? How should we share it? Working with your potential audiences, um, building lots of opportunities to share and um, check understanding. Um, think about how you're going to share it as well as what you're going to share. And also think about key events. So it could be that there's um, some key event coming up that's really relevant to your topic um, and thinking about how you can tie in with that. Um, so for one of our projects on intergenerational um, activities, there's a global intergenerational week. So we knew that we wanted to have something we could share at that time. So that gives you like a milestone. And it's good to start thinking about when those might be early so that it's not a big surprise when you get to it. Okay, next one. Again, with your key messages, I think I've said some of these things already. Um, starting early, um, having your plain language summary is a useful tool, considering all the potential audiences and what do they want to know. So it may be that it's really clear that who you want to um, communicate your main um, uh, message, but there might be some messages for researchers, there might be some messages for policy makers, for parents or other people. So think about all the different audiences and what they might want to know. And um, be prepared to um, deprioritize things that you feel important, but no one else seems to be interested in. So that's um, like referring to um, what I was saying about the methods. So you may be really interested in the methods. Um, and for some audiences, that might be a fabulous, that might be the message. But if you're trying to um, communicate something you want to share with um, people and they're going to do something with it, they may not be interested at all in, in the methods. Uh, next one. So um, the, it's, um, it's, it's often difficult to know what you're going to end up with, but you can maybe include a ballpark figure in the bid. Um, so you might not want to set out to say you're definitely going to do a video with, um, you know, six minutes long and whatever, but you could include an amount of money, say £1,500 or something, which you think would cover the various different options that you could do. Um, timing can be really challenging at the end of a project because um, often when we have contract uh, projects where people are on fixed term contracts, and the dissemination happens towards the end, and if something happens and everything gets shuffled along, it can be difficult to get the the creative have time to do the creative bit properly. Um, so again, start thinking about it early. Um, some of the things we're talking about can be quite time consuming, so it's important to you know really talk about it within the team. Is everybody keen on this? Is everybody going to help? Um, or is it something that isn't going to get um, a, a lot of take up? Um, and be realistic about what is possible. Um, so we have a podcast channel. We don't have many podcasts on it because actually we realised that most of the team aren't that keen on doing the podcast. So it sounded really good, and it does sound good. Um, but unless people are, it, but it take it's time consuming to talk without. Uh, to find the right people to talk and to record it properly and if there's not everybody doesn't have that passion then it doesn't it doesn't always work um next one yeah so the plan might change um you might have be really really keen to make podcasts like i just said um but if you if if your audience doesn't think that will be helpful or things like the pandemic or political situation might change so that the findings or results are not so 
interesting um, or may become very interesting. Uh, so you do need a bit of flexibility, but the multi-layered approach hopes, helpfully, hopefully helps mitigate some of these challenges. And then this is something which bothers me a bit, um, longe longevity. So will you be able to use the output after the paper's been published? So often we get to the end of the project, it's really exciting, and then we submit the paper for publication. Again, really exciting, then it gets published. And then we can have planned to be sharing different things at that time. But then what happens? So um, will you be able to use the, the product or the output afterwards? And how will you ensure that it's still accessible? Uh, so sometimes we have a project web page, but sometimes they don't get maintained. Um, will you be able to reuse any of the elements? And where will you store it? So those are just things to think about um, to be sure that the, all the work that you've done in producing the creative um, output is, then, is, not, is not lost. Uh, so the next one. Yeah, so I'm just going to give an example of that. So this um, is a lovely drawing that was done by Grace Elizabeth um, for a project that we did. Um, and I think this the picture figure appears in a journal publication. Um, and it's got lots of, um, it's all about the infodemic during COVID where there were just so many, so many, so many systematic reviews published on similar topics. And a lot of them weren't very good. Um, and so we distilled out some messages for various different audiences um, about what we could, who, what we need to be doing. And I think it was all for the time and um, it was all very exciting at the time, but we, I think we felt like we could do a bit more with it. Um, so uh, David Walker, who's the Penarc um, uh, creative person, media person, he was able to make it into an animation for us and we've actually used it as a we've used it on twitter as the animation and also we've used it in um sort of the introduction to several workshops so just giving it a little bit more life and i think how it might be able to play the animation just to give you an example of how that works he did it on some app on his phone i don't i think it was a free app Actually, yeah. Joe, I think time-wise, we will okay. share the link um, okay. so that people can have a look in the break if they want to or okay. further on. Um, and then Absolutely we'll move fine. on. If, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fab. Thank you. Uh, it is a super animation. It's very worth while having a look. Um, so we have a couple of minutes now for exercise two, which we will move on to here. There we go. Um, We'll do it in the chat rather than having breakout groups, just to give people a little bit of a break. Uh, and if we can just take a couple of minutes to think about different approaches that you might have used already in your research or that you would like to use. Um, and when I say different approaches, it could be all sorts of different ways of communicating research uh, in more creative ways. So it could be you know, blogs, podcasts, anything that Joe's talked about before or that we covered in workshop one or other ideas that you've got um, and then we'll just reflect on that and then we'll have our break in about five minutes okay we'll just take a couple of minutes to do that
This is fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, keep adding in. There's some really, really cool ideas. Uh, posters with key messages, podcasts, blogs, um, ideas for dissemination while getting sort of feedback from practitioners as well. Um, ideas about how to communicate sort of really, really dense, complex information in a compelling way. So how to, uh, for example, hand draw um, summary figures um, to really draw people in on that sort of complexity. Really lovely ideas. Um, so thank you all so much for um, adding in there. Do carry on um, as you want to. We're now going to have a 10 minute break. So it's 2.54. We'll come back at four minutes, probably five minutes past three. Um, and do whatever you want to do. Go and have